the warfare of Satan against the world system is not against the world system, it's against Christianity and against Judaism. Now Judaism and anti-Semitism is on the increase again. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can find wrong with, with Judaism. However, we've got to maintain a, a mental aspect that they are still have a, a very strong part to play in the end times and God still loves his people. The fact that they rejected and crucified the Messiah is one thing. But Gentiles would have no place at all if it were not for the fact that we were grafted in to the vine because of the neglect of the Jew. And if you love Jesus, then you love Jews because Jesus was a Jew. You've got, to be, you've got to be a little bit wise in these last days. And understand that if Satan is going to defeat Christianity, he cannot do it externally. He can't do it by coming against the cross. He has got to infiltrate the body of Christ, which is the most effective. If you get nothing else out of today, know this, that the weapons of our warfare cannot be carnal. They won't win. But they are mighty, dunamos in the Greek, through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Now, if you consider, let me consider this enemy within for a second, all right? There was a program on television that had to deal with parasites. And it's called The Enemy Within, and it's about the bugs that live inside you, in your gut. I mean, horrible. And uh, if you happen to suffer from anything like that, like an enemy within, same principles apply here. Through prayer and supplication, make your request be known unto God. I don't want any bugs living in my body. I pray every day. My wife prays for me all the time. Now, I'm having to suffer through some pain. Well, why? I don't ask why. I just go, I trust the Lord that sooner or later he will raise me up. Amen. In due season, I will reap if I don't quit. Amen. Right? So if I'm a little inconvenienced, it's like, you know, the prophet said, this sickness is not unto, or Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. Yeah. If it doesn't kill me, then sooner or later it'll make me stronger. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Inconvenient, perhaps, but robbing me of my salvation? No. You remember the story of the parable of the pair of the tares? I can say pears. The tares and the wheat? And, and, and Jesus said to the disciples... Because those ones that don't produce any edible fruit are tares. They look like wheat, smell a bit like wheat, but they're poisonous. When they come to fruitfulness and the, and the head of the grain opens up, spores come out which are poisonous. It's like a black dust, right? You can't eat them, they're good for nothing. All they do is when they burst, they corrupt the wheat that are right around them. Do you follow that picture? In the same way, when they asked Jesus the question, that's awful, Jesus. Who did this? Jesus said, an enemy hath done this. Who is our enemy? Satan is our arch enemy. He was created by God for a task, and he rebelled against that task, which was to bring light and became rather rebellious against the things of God and started to produce darkness. He was given authority. Do you know that Satan, up to the period where we read about in the book of Job, do you ever read that book there where it says that God asked Satan, a question, where, where have you been, Satan? And he said, I've been roaming around the earth. All right? And then another part, he says, and Satan presented himself before the angels of God. What does that tell you? I mean, don't try to figure out some interpret. The, the, the honest uh, uh, translation of that is that Satan had ability to be in the presence of God. But we're going to read in just a minute in the book of Revelation that he is no longer going to have access to heaven at all, but now he is going to be transferred, or we would say promoted sideways, to the earth. Now Satan is going to make, set up camp on the earth for one purpose only, to destroy the remnant. We are given some keys to the kingdom. I'm going ahead of myself a little bit. Prayer and supplication, weapon number one. Number two, revitalizing your righteousness before God. 
Because here's the thing. Not only are we woefully unprepared as, a, as, as the church or the body of Christ, we willfully break all the laws. We, we know what God wants, we just don't follow through with it. And then somehow we've been taught that grace will cover my sins. Grace does not cover sin. Your repentance covers sin. Grace gives you opportunity. Are you listening? Therefore, if the body of Christ willfully sins after knowing the truth, the Bible says, under the unction of the Holy Ghost, there's no further recompense. What are we going to do? Crucify Christ over again? He's already been crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected, and ascended once and for all. Now, whatever adjustments you and I need to make in these last days, when it says that in the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. Now, you know the scripture, but have you thought about its implication? You are in the last of the last days. And your troubles, your trials, your difficulties, your hurts, your pains, all of these things for a Christian who is in right standing with God are demonically launched. It means that God has you set up for something special and something important. When you do something that you know is sin, you ought to have almost an immediate knowledge and a conviction of the Holy Ghost. Don't do that anymore. So the tares and the wheat, just one example. Judas, three and a half years sitting with Jesus, and yet he was the enemy within. I just wrote a couple of scriptures down just to help reinforce this idea, and then I want to help you start thinking more about the people you call your friends. It's Proverbs 6.16. I hope I got the right one by the grace of God I do. Oh, good. These six things the Lord hates. Now, you don't find a lot of places in the Bible where it says the Lord hates something. He said, yes, seven are an abomination to God. Well, what are they? A proud look. Arrogance. Haughty. The enemy within is Dangerous because it's within. You don't always recognize it. Before you walk out of here today, you've got to start thinking, who do I know? Who do, who, who's my friends? Who do I allow inside my head? Who do I allow to pray with me? What books do I read? Do I still read horoscopes? Do I still seek Ouija boards? I mean, are there, are there supernatural weird stuff in my life that I still permitted? Do I go through the horoscope section now and again? It's a little door. All it needs. Demons are out there waiting to invade your life. Can they possess you? That's a word. But Jesus said, once you're born again, you better make sure you, you should keep your house furnished. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Well, if that's not abortion, what is Huh? What, we, what did he just say? I hate this. It's an abomination to me. Look at the next one. A heart that desires or devises wickedness. A strategist trying to figure out a way to ruin you. Last one. Oh, excuse me, almost last. Feet that are swift in running to evil. You know, more people want to hear about disasters than they want to hear about good things. You know that? I mean, you sit down and you start to tell someone horrible that's happened to your life and everything. They'll have 15 people sit there and say, oh, really? What, what happened then? And they have another group of people say, something really good happened to me. One or two. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Tell me about the horrible things again. It's just a human nature, but it's not Christ's nature. Next one. A false witness who speaks lies. They won't even have an inheritance in the kingdom. People who lie and know they're lying. And don't repent of it. Now look at the last one. And ones who sow discord amongst the brethren. Troublemakers. Whose job is it to upbraid a troublemaker? You. 
first time someone says something to you that makes you feel terrible, puts you down, mean, and someone who knows differently, out of your mouth should come this. I don't want to hear that. I thought you were my brother in Christ. I thought you were my sister in Christ. Why do you talk to me like that? Why do you speak about the pastor and his wife that way? Don't you have any fear of God in you at all? Why are you even here if you hate the place that much? If you can't speak something nice, don't speak anything at all. Just go away. Forget my phone number. Don't call me anymore unless it's to repent. And I'll pray with you. Otherwise, I don't want anything more to do with you. That's the way you fix it. Find yourself some new friends. Can you say amen? amen. Go to Revelation 6 verse 8. Revelation 6 verse 8. Then the woman fled into the wilderness. Who's the woman? Yeah. How about Israel? I, I, do I need to teach this to you? Because this part here where it floods into the wilderness, this, we're almost now into the second period of the, the, second period of the, the final three and a half years of tribulation. And, and Jesus mentions this actually in the book of uh, Matthew. So he's giving instruction to the Jews who come to Christ how to handle it in this particular dispensation of the tribulation. So I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him. Power was given over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. See that? Now, I read that the other day and I thought, that's a little crazy. Then I started to think to myself, where have I read beasts of the earth coming into the, into the scriptures? And I found that it's also, it's a number of different places. But the first one I read, it was in the book of Matthew, chapter 4 where Jesus was in the wilderness. Huh? He said he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and then, and then it talks about the beasts that were in the wilderness. He was with the beasts. Thank you, Lord. He was with the beasts in the wilderness. Now, we know that in Israel they had lions, right? You think that's what he's talking about? How about if I told you he's talking about Demons. Huh? That in the wilderness is where the demons hang out. Do you remember when Jesus went into the wilderness, found a madman there? He said he hung around with the tombs and the wild beasts. He was demon possessed. In these last days, you're not going to be wrestling with wild animals as much as you are with people who have demons. So this is the beast of the earth. So start thinking demons. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, and I want to read from verse uh, 7. And war broke out in the heavens. Michael and his angels. Now remember I told you that the book of Revelation is chronologically, you know, step on step on step. It does bounce around a little bit. The first three chapters, yes, deal with the church. After that, we start dealing with different dispensations of the church. This here, you'll discover as you read it, is talking about a certain part of a transition into the second half of the, of, of the tribulation. But it very much deals with where we are headed very soon. Very soon. There's nothing left to happen for us on this earth to be fulfilled. There's two or three prophecies that concerning Israel need to be fulfilled. But as far as the coming of Jesus Christ, we're, very, we're almost at the door. Revelation 3.20 told us Jesus is at the door of the church knocking, say, if you want to let me in, now's the time to do it. Right? That's already happening. Happened. Happened. War broke out in the heavens. Michael and his angels. Who's Michael? He is the warring angel, right? Michael the warring angel. And his angels, those who fight with Michael, fought with the dragon. Who is the dragon? Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back. Right? How many, Satan has one third of the angels that fell with him. We have two thirds. We have the majority. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, the Bible says, you know, when, when he's finally exposed, people will look at Satan and they say, is this the one that scared the world? And war broke out. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, next verse. But they did not prevail, nor, look at this and this now. Satan did not prevail. He never does. 
He did not provide. Remember that next time you think it's all over, I'm going to quit and go back to the world. They did not prevail, or his angels, nor was there a place found for them in heaven anymore. You hear that? So we're reaching a point now here where there's a transition where Satan up to this point has had access to the earth and to heaven. But now during this transition, moving into the second half of the period of tribulation where Israel, the bond between Israel and the European nations is broken and the Antichrist is already out of the closet. You and I will see him. You'll know who he is. Provided you live a reasonably long life. I mean, I was 48 and Jesus said, this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. So I fully expect to be able to identify Satan. I mean, Antichrist, who is the personification of Satan. Hmm? This is the seventh imam when it comes to Islam and the Muslims. He's their Antichrist. Antichrist is their salvation. <laughs> yeah, he's, the, he's, the, he's the counterfeit Jesus. <laughs> Unbelievable what we are now able to understand as Christians. You'll know him. You'll know him. But they did not prevail, nor was placed in heaven any longer. In other words, he's booted, he's booted out of heaven now. He has no access to angelic, uh, to heavenly uh, atmosphere. Next verse. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of the old identified the devil or Satan, Lucifer. He is cast out who has deceived the whole world. <laughs> he has deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels cast out with him. Now he has no longer have access to the angelic beings nor to the atmosphere outside 66 nautical miles or heaven as you know the dimension of heaven which I say, I've told you that. It's a dimension. It's not a geographical location per se. When the dimension of heaven comes to earth that's also the fulfillment of heaven to earth and they even gives you the dimensions of heaven. It's a thousand cubic miles. But anyway... That's for some other time. And he said, and his angels were cast out with him. Now where is Satan? Where are the demons? Where are those third of those warring devils that are caused, according to Daniel, to wear out the saints who wage war with the saints day and night? He doesn't wage war with churchgoers. He doesn't wage war with preachers who are backslidden and got girlfriends on the side. Are you listening? He wages war with you, you the saints, because you have the authority and power. Now, before I leave you today, I want to give you the final clue as to what you can do to break these curses off of yourself. And most of you are not doing this. You think you're doing it, but just thinking it isn't going to do it. We've got to move into a verbalization of what a very familiar pattern. But anyway, let's finish this. So it says... Uh, and it was cast to earth along with all his demon friends and Satan's out with him. Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Oh, Lord Jesus. Now he's cast down, but we have not yet got reason to rejoice. Almost, but not quite. Because remember, the Lord is coming back for a victorious church. Right? Where Satan is under your feet. A lot of you, he's not under your feet yet. He's in your head. He's in your heart. You cry too much. You should cry cheers of joy. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Amen. Next verse. He said, I, uh, and he says, and they overcame him, who is Satan, listen, by the blood of the Lamb. Okay, that's an assurance of your salvation. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all sin. He's talking about specifically repentance. Repentance. Be quick to repent. Be quick to forgive. Be quick not to judge your brothers and sisters in Christ. Huh? Be quick to find your way into the house of the Lord whenever you have a chance. It's hostile out there. The world's full of alligators, leviathan spirits, all kind of weird stuff. Are you ready? And it says, and by the word of their testimony, the word of their testimony, your vocalization of your walk with God, and they did not love their lives unto the death. 
you are willing to martyr yourself. Not necessarily physically, but certainly emotionally and spiritually. You are willing to take a secondary place. Listen, whatever else you do in this world, including raising your children, feeding your family, paying the bills, putting clothes on their back, educating them, buying a home, all of that stuff is secondary to your love of God. Love, family, ministry. It's the way it works. Are you listening? Seek the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength and with all of your substance and might. And love your neighbor as yourself. Come on now, children. Yeah. Last verse here. And therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. 